Uh, Mr. Hull. Thank you, Governor. I'll uh, <clears throat> try to be brief in my submissions. I wish to deal with the issue of uh, the bodily harm first. The Crown would concede in this case uh, Mr. Marley's argument with regard to the issue of bodily harm, except for uh, the officer's evidence that to this day he still suffers from injuries or still suffers the effects of a blow to the face. Yeah, he said, he said the odd time, I think. The odd time he has some pain. He says he has pain or he has some discomfort on that side of his face as a result of um, the punch which took place. So in my respectful submission, that takes it out of the uh, minor or trifling uh, nature. The definition is trifling definition. and transit, more than trifling and transit, transitory. And in my submission, that, that takes it out of that definition. But, but hold on a second. May I see Exhibit 1? Does the doctor, uh, having said that, it's a valid submission, except does the doctor say, doctor says mild to moderate, but I never saw him after the one, one week after the incident, I think is when he saw him. Uh, I don't, I don't think that has. I don't think that has any impact. Uh, it, on can, I, can I accept Officer Fantasia's what amounts to an opinion that his present jaw problems come from from this one incident, in the absence of anything more? Well, I mean, I think you can. I mean, I think it's almost like a res ipsa loquitur type situation where you've got the officer saying, "You know, I was struck in the jaw. I've had this received these had injuries before, at the time, and then since. ever since I've got." I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable and logical uh, right. flow or conclusion. So in my respectful submission, you can accept that, and the court is, is able and entitled to, to make that uh, connection and logic as it relates to, to that. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the issue of self-defense, because that is, that is one of the... Um, so you're not, now you're talking about the punch. Talking about the punch, um, there has to be an air of reality to the argument of self-defense. So what air of reality is there here? Your Honor has to look at, Your Honor can't look at the issue of, uh, of self-defense in a vacuum. You've got to look at the totality of the evidence that's before you. The accused wants the court to accept that he was fearful for his safety at the point where the officer is reaching into his coat or in his, um, into his clothing. The totality of the evidence, though, is that this accused person is walking through a dangerous park at 11.30 at night that he knows to be frequented by drug users in a shady part of town. His evidence is that he sees two essentially heroin addicts fighting. He acknowledged that it's not unreasonable to assume that either one or both of those persons could be armed with guns, knives, or needles. So you're, you're asking me then to reject totally his evidence. Yes, the, I am. Under and, and the for, second and third grounds of WD. That's right, and I'll, I'll address WD in, in, in a minute. But as it relates to the self-defense issue, in, with the totality of the evidence, in my respectful submission, there is no air of reality. He's put himself essentially in harm's way by his own choice, knowing full well that either one of these two persons could be armed with knives, guns, needles. The whole circumstance of where he is and what he's doing, in my respectful submission, takes the air of reality away from him suggesting that he had any type of reasonable fear for his safety uh, at the time. He's almost, I suppose, the author of his own misfortune in, in some ways, by involving himself into this. Now that's not even touching on whether or not you believe him or have a reasonable doubt as to whether or not he knew that Officer Fantasia was a police officer. Let's look at that for a minute. Officer Fantasia and his evidence indicated that he shouted out, I'm a police officer, I'm a cop, whatever the words were. And quite fairly in my respectful submission, when you're assessing Officer Fantasia evidence, I mean, he said, is it possible he didn't hear me? I guess, I suppose it's possible. I think more important in Officer Fantasia's evidence, not that it was possible that he didn't hear me, at least with respect to the pulling, uh, 
is that it might have been said too late to avoid the pulling. But if I accept that, by the time they're standing up, by the time they're standing up in whatever that short period of time, between the time they stand up facing each other, O'Brien punches Fantasia. What if, what if I find that um, by that time O'Brien did know that, that Fantasia had said it, but then Fantasia on his own evidence is reaching into his pocket and then what do you do? Well, I mean, I think the crown. How does that affect the? the well, I equation? think I think the, the crown has to be the crown has to take a very fair approach to this. Yes. Yeah. And as Mr. Marley indicated, he did not ask for particulars. But I think the crown, the, the theory of the crown's case, is that the um, that the accused knew on the poll that before, officer Fan, before, the, before poll. the poll that officer yeah. Fantasia was a police officer. It would be unfair for the crown at this point kind of tailor its theory right. um, to either your honor's submission or to the evidence. It's the Crown's, it's been the Crown's theory from the outset that Officer Fantasia indicated to Mr. O'Brien uh, before he was pulled off uh, Mr. Friedbrain. And, and again, when you're assessing the evidence of the accused, and you have to do that, the accused took the stand, so his evidence needs to be assessed like any other witness at this point. You have to look at the totality of the evidence. The totality of the evidence is that, that the accused wants you to, to accept that not only did he not hear Officer Fantasia indicate he was a police officer, he also didn't hear uh, the other officer running across the park yelling and shouting that he's a police officer. So does that have an air of reality to it in the totality of the evidence? Can you accept that? Under the circumstances, the air of re or sorry, the the second officer running and saying, uh, "I'm a police officer." I don't know how that assists the crown, even if O'Brien had heard him saying that. But that's It'd but that's the point. But it, it affects his credibility. That's the point. It, only on the issue of credibility, yes. because unless the second officer said, "I'm a police officer," and that guy you're punching or pulling is also a police that's officer, right. then it only, affect, it only goes so far as affecting uh, Mr. O'Brien's credibility. That's correct. All right. That's correct. And while we're on the topic of Mr. O'Brien's credibility, you have to look at the motive behind this. What? There is motive. The motive is that Mr. O'Brien belongs to this coalition. Part of the coalition. He's an advocate. Yeah. He's an advocate uh, against uh, the police or at least against certain police action. He sees a police officer assaulting in his mind another individual, and he decides he's going to take action. And so in my respectful submission, uh, when you're assessing uh, Mr. O'Brien's evidence, as you need to do within the totality of the evidence, you ought not to believe him, and you ought not to uh, find, in my respectful submission, that his evidence raises a doubt in your mind, given all of the evidence uh, that's what before I, you. On the second and third sorry, on the second and third branch, of WD, what do I do with the evidence of the second officer that he didn't hear any, he didn't hear Fantasia saying he was a police well, officer? you know, that's always an interesting defense submission in, in, my, in my view. Because the defense submission seems to go like this. If, I, if there's two witnesses that testify consistently, the defense submission usually is, well, they it's concocted. Yeah, they collude. There's collusion. Yeah. If the two witnesses testify with inconsistencies between the two, well, you ought not to believe it because there's inconsistencies. What, do, 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 but what your honor it, knows that witnesses are going to hear and see and recall things completely differently. And as your honor's I pointed out, that, that I, I, Officer Ugox is and, running. And, and I, I said to Mr. Marley, the second officer is yelling, so it's entirely possible. Having said that, I, I agree with what I think is your next submission or implicit in what you just said is, I can accept some, none, or all of any witness's testimony, right. and I'm able to do that. But that all has to be um, um, considered in light of the Crown's obligation to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Of course, and, but, and, but the issue is this, though. I think sometimes the, the, the issue with WD is, is that You've got the three steps to WD, but there's also 
There's also a fourth step in the sense that WD does not overrule or overturn the judge's obligation to view the totality of the evidence. Well, you must it. assess WD within the totality of the evidence. Well, that's the third ground on all of the evidence. Well, in all of the I evidence, accept. but when you're assessing the accused evidence, it's when you when you apply WD, you don't apply it just in a vacuum. You have to apply it with no, the totality. No, I agree with that. Okay. So there's certainly uh, there's certainly discrepancies between uh, Officer Vantage's evidence and the other officer's evidence, but those are to be expected. This was, as indicated in the evidence, a very short heated um, exchange that went on here. And people are going to recall things differently uh, as between witnesses. As it relates to the evidence of uh, Mr. Friedbrain, I'll just touch on that briefly and then uh, sit down. I would simply leave this with your honor. If that had been a crown witness, <laughs> being called by the crown right. against Mr. O'Brien, it would be an incredibly difficult sell to any judge or any jury to accept anything that Mr. Freebrain said. And in my respectful submission, he has animus, uh, not only to this particular officer, but to the police in general. He blames this officer for uh, essentially sending him to jail for six years. He wished physical harm upon the officer. And this was his opportunity to get back at the officer. He is by his own record and by his own admission, a dishonest individual. Any evidence in my respectful submission that, um, that he gives, whether it be really for the Crown or for the defense, I suppose, is something which the court has to look at very, very skeptically. But the, the, the problem is that there is some, some confirmation in the second off of his evidence by the second officer's evidence. With regard to? Uh, the the second um, the major discrepancy in the Crown's case is that Officer Fantasia said, "I just want to get Freddie out of there because I'm undercover. I'm looking after my own safety. I realize that I don't really have the authority to do much in the sense, but Freddie pushed me first. But the second officer said." That's not what he saw. He saw them, he couldn't hear, but he saw them in an animated discussion, and Officer Fantasia pushed Freddie first. So here's the problem. Uh, Officer Fantasia says, and, and you, you may not be able to fault the officer, uh, an undercover officer is in a dangerous position, especially in a park such as this, he does not want his cover blown, but he admits, number one, I don't have the authority to tell Freddie to get lost, or I can do it, but he doesn't have to do it. Number two, um, I, he pushed me, but, but off, the second officer clearly said, I saw Fantasia push Freddie first, which is well, what Freddie said. I'll, I obviously defer to your honor's notes. As I understood the evidence, the second officer indicated that it was um, Mr. Friedbrain that was kicking and swinging or punching at, at officer. Oh, he said that, but, uh, but he said Freddie, I'm sorry, Fantasia pushed him first. Hold on, I'll check, I'll check my notes. But well, I'll leave that to your honor for when you uh, ultimately give your ruling on this. I, um, I want to deal with the, I suppose, the, the issue that has been raised now is whether or not he was executing his duty. He certainly had no authority at this point to order uh, Mr. Freebrain out of the park. He certainly had authority to investigate whether or not Mr. Freebrain was violating his parole conditions. He certainly had that. He certainly had the authority, as he was there, um, to conduct investigations as it related to the sale of drugs in the park. He knows Mr. Freebrain has a history of tr drug trafficking and was convicted. He's in the park, known for uh, the buying and selling of drugs. And those are things that Your Honor has to take into consideration as part of the constellation of facts and as to what was in the officer's mind at the time that he is doing what he's doing. So in my respectful submission, he, he is in the lawful execution of his duty by investigating whether or not Mr. Freebrain is by then his parole, by general investigative purposes and enforcement purposes of um, ensuring the drugs aren't being sold or trafficked 
in the park. And by his evidence, at least, he's assaulted by Mr. Friedbrain at that point with the push and is in the lawful execution of his duty, my respectful submission, of defending himself, taking down Mr. Friedbrain, and potentially effecting an arrest upon him. Well, assuming that's correct, he has a general duty to investigate under the Police Act. But here's my notes. He saw Freddie, who was a parolee, who was close enough to identify Freddie. It was a well-lit area, which is not what Fantasia said. He said it wasn't well-lit. There was an animated, I'll, I'll use the word, uh, my notes just say approximately 30 to 60 seconds animated. But then Fantasia placed his hands on Freddie, who moved back, then became aggressive. So once Fantasia places his hands on Freddie, not effecting an arrest because Freddie hadn't done anything, even on Fantasia's evidence, once he places his hands on Freddie, that's an assault. Because well, Freddie, let, let's face it, it, the one past tri whether it gets past a. a a trifling nature. I mean, whether it gets past de minimis, oh, I don't, simply placing I don't his know hand that, on... That, I don't know that the definition of assault says that. It's an unwanted touching. But you a have kiss, to, a there kiss has to be can de minimis. Be, there has to get past be, de minimis. I'm sorry? It has to get past the de minimis test. On, on what basis does a police officer, what, on what, what right does a police officer have to place his hands on anybody who A, is not arrested, B, is not detained, for instance, for a man investigation, what right does a police officer ever have to place his hands on a, a, a citizen, whether he's a parolee or not, in a, in a drug area? Well, that issue wasn't explored with Officer Fantasia as to what reasoning there potentially was. I wouldn't. If I were defense counsel, I'd leave it. Because the officer says that didn't happen. Right. Right. So that that issue wasn't explored so, and I can't I'm not going to speculate as right. to what the officer may or may not have been doing at that point because the officer says that didn't happen. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, that's obviously an issue that your honor has to decide when looking at the evidence and looking at whether or not the crown has proven its case or not. Well, and so if there's any questions, sir, those are my submissions. Right. Thank you. Mr. Marlin? Nothing in reply, your honor.